Greetings, fellow explorers. This is Tony with Fount Systems Network, and we are here in pursuit of low carbon innovations for industrial wastewater treatment. This episode is part two of two on treating wastewater from metal finishing. Now, metal finishers produce some of the more toxic wastewater out there. It contains arsenic, cyanide, chromium, lead, just to name a few of the heavy metals that you'll find. We're gonna see how these companies treat their wastewater to remove heavy metals from it before they discharge it. If this all sounds a little obscure or strange, then you probably missed part one, and I'm gonna post a link to it right here, where I talk about just how important it is to your health and the health of your friends and family. We also talk about the Clean Water Act and how effective it has been at helping clean up America's waterways. Now, if you're new to Found Systems Network and you like what you see here, do like and subscribe to the channel. Now let's get started. First, let's look at the current operating permit for that large metal finishing shop in Miami, which we explored in the previous episode. This permit is super useful to us since it describes all of the equipment that they use to treat their wastewater, as well as the specific contaminants that they're required to treat and monitor. Let's look at the more important pieces of gear that they use and which are described in the permit. And from there, let's see if we can speculate about what their wastewater treatment process might look like. The permit here describes a collection sump, chemical feed systems, two cyanide oxidation tanks, a chromium reduction tank, pH adjustment tank, a lamella clarifier and associated coagulation and flocculation steps, a filtration system, a filter press, and finally a sludge dryer. That's a quick list, but what do each of these pieces of equipment do and how do they work together? Let's take this list of equipment and try to think about what a treatment process diagram would look like. Now, before we look at that water treatment process diagram, I actually had the great privilege of being able to share it with a gentleman named Craig Gagnon. And Craig is a water treatment expert, and he essentially confirmed with me that the treatment process diagram is good. So I was pretty happy about that, as you might be able to imagine. Uh, I do hope to share Craig's work with you all in a future episode, but for now, Let's zoom in at the start of the treatment process and we will walk through that together. The permit calls out three different wastewater types shown here as chromium, cyanide, and acid alkali bearing wastewaters. Hopefully you remember that previous episode, that small chrome electroplating shop with all those different separate chemical treatment steps and rinsing baths. I'm going to assume that this shop in Miami also has a similar process, which would be supportive of isolating the wastewater streams. The first piece of equipment here is a single sump to receive those different kinds of wastewater. I think they're staging their wastewater so that it can be treated in batches. This sump would receive batches of wastewater having all the same kinds of contaminants. For example, the copper electroplating baths, as well as the rinsing baths from copper electroplating would be discharged into this sump all at the same time. The sump allows for the equalization of the contaminants into a single concentration, and it also allows for sampling and measurement of the water quality. From the sump, depending on the contaminants to be treated, I think that the equalized batch of wastewater would be pumped to one of three different treatment processes. One, the cyanide oxidation process up here. Two, straight to the main pH adjustment tank in the middle, or three, the chromium reduction process at the bottom of the diagram. The chem notes you see here indicated in process one and three are the addition of treatment chemicals that are mixed into the tanks with the wastewater. These chemicals are the treatment. They're used to destroy the cyanide and to reduce the chromium to a more benign form. Then after the cyanide is destroyed or the chromium is reduced, those specific batches are then pumped to the pH adjustment tank. Looking back at step two in the middle, some of the wastewater doesn't need cyanide destruction or chromium reduction, so I'm showing it all going straight to the pH adjustment tank. There is one large pH adjustment tank, and like the first sump, I think it's used to hold and equalize the wastewater. It allows for more sampling and measurement and adjustment of the pH in preparation for the next step, which is the actual separation or waste removal process, the lamella clarifier. The lamella clarifier is where the dissolved cadmium, chromium, copper, nickel, silver, lead, and zinc get separated out. Let's take a closer look at the lamella clarifier in action. Here we're seeing precipitant being mixed into the wastewater and we can see precipitation starting. What we're seeing here is the dissolved metals, metals being chemically coaxed out of solution and forming very small particles. Now these particles will tend to stay in suspension, but 
the mixture is pumped to the flocculation tank where a flocculant is mixed into the wastewater. The flocculant makes all those very small particles gather together into larger flocks, which are more dense than the water they're mixed in. Then this wastewater is pumped into the lamella clarifier, which promotes the settling of the flocks out of the mixture. Then the treated water, called the supernatant, is pumped out of the top of the clarifier for further treatment. Now we have two different streams coming out of the lamella clarifier, the water and the solids. I think that the water coming out of the clarifier gets filtered and then it gets discharged into the sewer system. Now I'm not clear on what degree it gets filtered or what is being filtered for because the permit doesn't indicate it. At a minimum, I would expect filtration for turbidity, but their permit doesn't have any stipulations for turbidity. Or this filter could actually be a membrane system that removes the benzene, vinyl chloride, and other toxic organics that their permit does regulate. Unless these toxic organics get removed during the course of the metal treatments, I don't see any other equipment in the permit that could remove these except for some kind of membrane system. So the filtered water is discharged to the sewer. Now let's get back to the solids. The sludge coming out of the bottom of the clarifier gets pumped to a sludge holding tank and then to a 10 cubic foot plate filter press. Here's an example of a very simple plate filter press being used to separate solids from wastewater. The water gushing out here has been filtered through the press. And here we're seeing what the remaining solids can look like. The general idea here is to remove as much, much water as feasible from the solids in order to reduce the dumping fees at the landfill, which is where these solids are going to ultimately be disposed of. The water that is wrung out from the sludge will get pumped to the filter system prior to discharge into the sewer. So that provides a quick summary of what that metal finishing shop in Miami might be doing. But how about in Milwaukee? How were those shops getting such good results treating their wastewater? Here, the metal loading study also gives us an answer to this question. It says that the vast majority of metal finishing shops are using cyanide oxidation, chromium reduction, and hydroxide precipitation. These are exactly the treatments that we just looked at. So this should give us some confirmation that we're looking at current best practices. What else does the metal loading study tell us? It summarizes here the improvements made to technology between 1990 and 2015. The significant improvements appear to be better process controls, such as real-time sensors, more accurate chemical feed equipment, as well as more benign chemistries in the metal finishing baths themselves. All of this is really good news, I think. So this completes for now our episodes on metal finishing. You know, I really wanted to take a close look at metal finishing because of a conversation I had with a gentleman earlier this year. He used to be an IPP manager at Cape Canaveral, Florida, which is near the Kennedy Space Center. You can imagine there's a lot of metal finishing going on there. He described how difficult it was to ensure compliance with the EPA regulations. He said it was a nightmare. Now, maybe this was years ago and it's better now. I'm not sure, but it looks like it's being handled well in Miami and Milwaukee. Now, where our pursuit is concerned, I have to say that the wastewater treatment processes that I'm seeing here don't really lend themselves to low carbon innovations, at least not where these companies' direct emissions are concerned, what you'd call their scope one or scope two emissions. Yeah, there, there's electrical energy being used to pump the wastewater through the treatment process, but it's just not that significant. And the carbon impacts associated with this could be reduced with the simple addition of photovoltaic panels on the roofs of the workshops. The carbon emissions that we should be most concerned with come from the specialty chemical providers that supplied the products to the metal finishing shops. Uh, these are the manufacturers of the chemicals that go into that metal finishing process. I'll bet there's a lot of embodied carbon in these specialty materials. At the same time, those emissions aren't under the direct control of the metal finishing shops. But maybe it's possible, just like Apple and Walmart, for example, have started doing, that metal finishers could start requiring their suppliers to reduce the environmental burdens of their operations. I'll be keeping my eye out for this. In the meantime, I'm going to review this list of all these different EPA categories and see if I can't narrow it down to a few industries that have either direct carbon emissions that can be improved and also whether there might be recoverable materials and nutrients in the wastewater as a way of focusing the pursuit a little more. So that's it for now, everyone. Thank you for watching. If you like what you see here on the Fount Systems Network, do like and subscribe to the channel, follow us on Twitter, and remember everyone, Keep exploring, keep growing. I'll see you next time.